God Almighty, we thank you. God, we thank you that you are wonderful. Your name is so powerful. And so we honor you in this moment because there is none like you. God, when politicians and presidents and people fail us, you are still an almighty God. When it seems like resources run out, you are still an almighty God. When things seem to fall to pieces, you are still an almighty God. And for that, we thank you today. We thank you. We honor you because there is none like you in all the earth. And so in this moment, God, we want you just to continue to speak. We want to continue to worship your presence. My prayer is simple, that you would stand in my body, that you would think with my thoughts, that you would talk with my tongue, that we would hear a word from you, that you would be the speaker and I would simply be the microphone. And for that, we would give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, freedom. Let's give God some praise today in the chat. Come on, wherever you are, unless you're driving, I need to see some emojis in the chat. Let's lift our hands and clap our hands and honor our great God, the God who is almighty, the God whose name is great. Come on, let's honor him and worship him for what he deserves and what he is doing. It is just good to be in the presence of the Lord. Well, good morning, Freedom. Most of you know me. If not, I'm Pastor Ralph. So excited uh, just to stand with you and hang out with you this morning as we just worship our great King. Uh, and I'm just excited. It's, it's, I've, been, I've been on tiptoe anticipation. I've been excited just to present what God has just been speaking in this season. Um, Pastor Robert and I have been talking and just uh, what we want, what we know that God is trying to say to his people during this time. And you all are in a series, right? So it's a crossover series. You just ended the WTF crossing over into Between Two Gardens, right? That's the name of the series, Between Two Gardens, where last week you started in the garden in the end, in Revelation 22, really this garden of life, where this tree of life is. Well, today we got to go back to that first garden and we have to go to the garden of Eden. And I believe the word is going to challenge you and change you today if you receive it. As always, I love your pastor, my big brother, his wonderful wife, his girls. They are family freedom. You are family to me. And so go ahead and go with your boy as we jump into this word today. Are we ready for a word? Come on, tell me. Say yes, I'm ready in the chat. Go ahead and put that in there. Yes, I'm ready for a word. Here we go. You know where we're going, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter number two, uh, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter number three. We're going to look at several verses, but I'll read three verses to you to get us started. Genesis chapter two, Genesis three. First book of the Bible for you new Christians. Genesis, the book of Bereshi, the book of beginnings. Chapter two, verse number nine. I'm reading the New Living Translation for this, but it says this, the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Okay. Genesis chapter three, verse six says this, the woman was convinced. Press pause. Let's give you context. Text without context is conning you out of the text. Here we go. You got to remember these trees in the garden. The woman is here now. The serpent shows up. They have a conversation. He says, hey, you can eat this. Don't, don't, don't listen to what the Lord says. He's trying to keep you from being like him. You can eat this fruit. It'll be good for you. And the text says the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. 
I want to tag these texts with this title this morning, Food Poisoning. <laughs> I want to talk about food poisoning. Forget that. Forget that. It's a crossover, right? It's a crossover series. Uh, 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 last week was We Taste Fruit. Uh, let's talk about fruit poisoning. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're going to talk about in this second installment of Between Two Gardens. What happens when you have fruit poisoning? Uh, I will never forget, I'm about 16 or 17 years old, um, I got my little girlfriend, I'm driving a black Dodge Neon with the silver shiny hubcaps, I'll never forget this, and I, I grew up back in the day, you know, in the 90s, when you were going with somebody, when you when you had the matching t-shirts, and you go to Six Flags, uh, and you'd hang out, where, where were Fort Worth people at, you you go to Arlington and go to Six Flags with your boo, and, and it, it was a season where you'd wear the polo t-shirts with the canvas polo shoes, uh, and, and I'm all dressed up. I got my, my clothes on, and I'm ready to go to Six Flags. We're going to kick it. We're going to get there early. I wake up. My parents know. So my mom, she's cooking breakfast. She's got it all laid out for me. And so I go down the stairs, and I say, hey, Mom, I'm getting ready to head out. She says, wait, wait, wait. I cooked breakfast for you. No, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to grab something on the way, and I'm going to get there. And I remember driving and stopping by this restaurant that I won't name because they're not endorsing this stream right now. But I stopped by this restaurant. Maybe you, you'll figure out uh, who it is because they used to serve these two biscuits for $2. And so I pulled into the drive through and got two sausage biscuits for $2 and a small orange juice. And I'm feeling good until about 15 minutes after I finished eating them on my 40-minute drive deep in the North Fort Worth Keller area to meet my girl and her cousin and their friends, I started feeling real funny. And I mean real funny that by the time I got in the house, I'm sorry, I know it's TMI, it was coming out of both ends. I mean, I was messed up, never made it to Six Flags, had to drive home, had to pull over constantly on the freeway because I was vomiting uncontrollably. I was sick for weeks. Hear me, I bypassed what my mother prepared for me. I stopped at that restaurant and I found myself sick. Listen, because I chose the glamorous option over the pre-prepared one in my mother's house, it damaged me. Because I chose the quick fix and I didn't choose the labor of love that my mother presented before me, I found myself sick. And here's what I what messed me up, that I only felt better when I was exiting out of me what I should have never put in me to begin with. Listen to me. I had food poisoning. Yep, I had food poisoning. And Adam and Eve... In the text, they can relate because God has set them up nicely. He has properly prepared a paradise for their pleasure. And here stands Adam. Here stands Adam and the woman. Adam, who he later names Eve, in a garden. Yep, this is garden number one. And in this moment, they are not between two gardens. They are standing between two trees. And they choose what was detrimental for them over what was designed for them. They chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They chose what they were looking at with their eyes instead of what had been beneficial to their lives. And they wind up with fruit poisoning. So can I suggest to you? That many of you will go out today, that the stream will end, you'll worship, you'll pray, and you're going to go out, and you're going to go to brunch somewhere, and you're going to go to lunch, and you're going to smash some food, and it's going to be good, and you're going to feel physically fine, but the reality is you're suffering from fruit poisoning. You're physically fine, but you're spiritually sick because like Adam and Eve, we have this tendency to choose what looks good to our eyes instead of what's good for our lives. Because here's what I need you to get. Write this in the chat. Type this in the chat. Write this in your notes. Okay, I know some of y'all don't take notes. Write this down anyway. Everything you see isn't always everything you see. Yep, I said it. I'm going to say it again. Everything you see isn't always everything you see because what's attractive on the surface can be assaulting underneath your skin. I need you to hear me. What's attractive on the surface can be assaulting underneath your skin. And what Adam and Eve do is they choose death. 
I need, I, need you to, I need you to sit in that. Let me calm down. I need you to sit in that for a second. Adam and Eve chose death. Can we talk? Let me help. Can, can you climb on the couch like me? Can, can we go to therapy for a second? Come, come on and cross your hands. Come on, let, let, me, let me be your spiritual therapist for a second. Here, 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 it's about to be controversial. Let, cancel me later. I, I got to ask you this question. I got to talk to you about this. Because if we be honest, sometimes death looks more attractive than life. If we be real honest, sometimes death looks more attractive than life. You say, I can't believe you said that, preacher, but ask Elijah. In 1 Kings 17, Elijah is the man, and he tells Ahab it's not going to rain. In 1 Kings 17, he finds himself at the Kareth Brook Ravine, and he gets water from the river, and the ravens bring him food. And when the, when the brook dries up, he's sent to the widow at Zarephath, and everything is good. By chapter 18, he's facing the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, and he wipes them from the face of the earth, and everything is good. And Jezebel still looks at him and says, I don't care how bad you were before Ahab. Have or Ashtoreth, I'm going to still kill you. And 1 Kings 19 says that Elijah runs for his life, finds himself under a broom tree, and you know what looked good to him in that moment? Death. He was suicidal. He was ready to quit. He was ready to throw in the towel. Listen, I'm sorry. Sometimes death looks better than life does. Ask anyone, if you be honest in this chat, who has considered suicide. And we could call them back. Ask anyone who has committed suicide. But here's where I want to help you. I don't want to get morbid because, listen, it's not our job to choose what's attractive. It's our job to choose what's advantageous. Preach, man. It's our job not to choose what looks good. It's our job to choose what is good because what's good for me may not always look good to me. The issue is always the grass is greener mentality because here's, here's the problem. Often what I can't have or don't have looks more attractive than what I do have. Last week, last week, your pastor, he hooked you up. He said this. He said, don't let what's attractive take you away from your assignment. Can I mess with you, though? Here's the kicker. Here's what makes that so heavier than what it was even last week. The tree of life was attractive. It wasn't just it wasn't just the death that was attractive. The tree of life was attractive too. not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I know we hang our hat there that Eve said that, listen, she thought to herself, the tree looked good. It looked delicious. It looked good to her eyes. But the tree of life was beautiful, too. I got Bible. Genesis chapter two, verse nine. Look at it. Genesis chapter two, verse nine says this. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is what pleasant to the sight and good for food wait what yep every tree which tree every tree yep every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they both looked good but they chose the one they couldn't have <laughs> <laughs> they could eat from the tree of life all day, no problem, no restriction on life, but they got tired of the tree of life, whoo, and they wanted something that was not for them. Why? Here we go. I'm going to come for you now. Here we go. Because we often let, what, we often let what's commendable become common. Ooh, come here, come here. Don't let your blessings become common. The tree of life became common to them. Hear me well. Don't let what's extraordinary become common just because it's convenient. Don't let what should be commendable become common just because it's convenient. Yeah, like your marriage. Because you all, you wanted a boo for so long. You wanted a girl who wasn't going to use you for so long. And now that you have her, you dress up better to leave her than you do for her. It, it, it's become common. You spend more time with everybody else but him. Yep. Don't let it become common like the job you pray for. 
You, you beg for this job. I need a promotion. I need a raise. I need a new job. And now you complain about the commute. You complain about the coworkers. You complain about the content. You just complaining. It's become common. Don't let it be like the opportunity you beg for. You finally got the business. Finally got some Instagram followers. Now you don't want to do the work. Don't let it become like the child you prayed for. Because now you calling your mama every other day to come get them because they driving you crazy. Your blessing has become common because it's convenient like the church you attend. Yep, I said it. I said it because what other church is having service at the Botanic Gardens next week? That's not common, but you let it become common because it's yours. They consumed the wrong tree because the tree that was available to them became common simply because it was convenient. Remember, 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 right? Let me help you, right? Let's go back. I got to hook this together. Last week, right? Our success is seen by what we contribute, not what we consume. What we contribute, not what we consume. So every tree, this is what I need you to get. This is not exhaustive, but I got to teach you. I got to teach you every tree has a different function. So you need to know what type of tree you're looking at so that you know what to do with it. <laughs> Listen, some trees, some trees are for covering. Ask Elijah. He, he gets under the broom tree and it covers him from the from the hot sun. That's first Kings 19. Some trees are for consuming. That's the fig tree. That's why in Mark chapter 11, Jesus curses the fig tree because it does not produce for him food to consume when he's hungry. Now, I got some Bible scholars on here, and you said, we in Genesis 3, though. We, right, Ralph, we in Genesis 3, and when they fall, they're going to take some figs, and they're going to sew them together, and they're going to cover themselves. So you wrong. You wrong because the fig can be for consuming and covering. No, 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 no. Keep reading the text. The Lord shows up, and he removes the figs from their body. He slays an animal and covers them with skin because he doesn't want them to wear what they should eat. Some trees are for covering. Some trees are for consuming. Some trees are for covenant. Woo, the tree of life is a tree of covenant. We see that in Genesis chapter 2. Come back next week. That'll make more sense. And then some trees are for crushing. Oh, you, you think I forgot what Sunday this is? I, I just didn't say it on purpose. It's Palm Sunday. Some trees are for crushing. If you go read Matthew 21 and Luke 19, the Bible says they don't put palm leaves over him. They don't put palm leaves in him. They don't put palm leaves around him. They put palm leaves on the ground and he crushes them. He walks over them with his feet. So you got to understand what tree you're looking at so you don't make the same decision that Adam and Eve made because it caused, say it with me, fruit poisoning. And fruit poisoning has consequences. If we're standing between these gardens and we're living between these gardens, we got to pay attention to the trees that are in them. Here we go. Let's do work. Three things I want you to get and I'll get out your way and let you go to brunch. Number one, fruit poisoning is seen when we choose independence over relationship. Number one, it's when we choose independence over relationship. Uh, let, let me make it real simple. Uh, the tree of knowledge, what knowledge? This is the first knowledge. This was the consequence of mental knowledge. It's the consequence of mental knowledge because consuming this tree caused them to want and to essentially have independence from God. The serpent says this in Genesis 3 verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing, hope y'all caught that, knowing mental knowledge, knowing good and evil. Okay, so here we go. So when you choose what has been created over the creator, you cause a separation. Why? Because God doesn't share. Okay. You, you got to remember. You got to remember. Let me help you with this. Let me make it real simple. You got to remember, you and I, we're made in the image of God. This is why your toddlers act like that without you having to teach them. 
because they just come into the world and had something in the Imago day perverted by the culture. Toddlers don't like to share. Everything is mine. That's how God is. He's a jealous God. He's the whole show. He's the headliner and he's the opening act. Okay, let me help you. Listen, either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Let me help you. Okay. Uh, I grew up old school. Where my old school? Where my old school people? I grew up with the grandmama with the plastic on her furniture. That's how I grew up. I grew up with the grandmama with the plastic on her furniture. I grew up with the mama and the grandmama that told me you don't sit at the grown folks table. Yeah, when the grown folks at the table, when they talking, you don't go in there and run your mouth. That's their space. That's their room. You stay out of there. That, okay. Uh, I, I grew up with that kind of fan. I grew up with a mama that when she started to make it, there were certain rooms we just didn't go in. You don't go in the living room. It's pretty. It's decorated. It's all taken care of. I don't care that you live here. You don't go in there. I'm like, what? Yep. No, no grown folks table, no living room, plastic on the furniture. What am I trying to say? We treat God the same way my mother and grandmother treated their houses. We, we treat God because we tell him some places are off limits. We tell him some rooms are off limits. And this is what happens. We let the tree convince us that it was sufficient for the places we don't want God to show up in. We, we think it's sufficient. We think the tree is sufficient for the places we don't want God to touch. And so we crave independence. I just want an independent woman. Don't come get me, beehive. I know. But independent women. I want an independent woman. I'm going to be an independent man. No, 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 no. We crave independence as if detachment has ever produced power. When has detachment ever produced peace or power? Or provision. Hear me. This freedom. You know this. This freedom, church. I just got to give it to you again. You're supposed to know this. Freedom is not detachment. It's detangling. I'm going to say it again. Freedom is not detachment. It's detangling. Freedom is not about removing what I am connected to. Freedom is about removing what should not be connected to me. <laughs> Listen, we all come from him. We need to be connected to him. The problem is we just get tangled up in it. So we let it overshadow him. We let it overpower him. And the tree begins to lie and say, you don't need him because you have it. Okay. So what happens is that lie causes our relationships, which shows independence, causes our relationships to get damaged. Yep. Both of them. Both, both of them, the vertical one and the horizontal one, okay? Here we go, here we go. The vertical one, the vertical one, Genesis 3, verse 9. The vertical one, vertical, okay? Watch what it says. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Okay, so here we go. The Lord asked, where are you? As if he don't know. <laughs> I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Like, bro, bro, what? Me, me and the Lord, we had that kind of relationship. Bro, why are you asking questions you already know the answer to? He, he says, Lord, where are you? God, I'm reading this text. I see this all the time. Why are you asking me a question and you know the answer? And this is what he told me. Uh, uh, my daughter, I got a seven-year-old princess. My daughter, Eden, many of y'all know her. Uh, she went through this phase where she loved to hide. And so uh, uh, she does it every now and then uh, at bedtime. But it used to be every day where I would come home and she'd hide. She'd hide in the cabinets. She'd hide in the closet. She'd climb up her closet, hide on shelves, hide under the bed. She just liked to hide. So much so she would get the iPad and hide. And in my mind, she just forgot she was hiding. I mean, she, she just hide. The problem is I'd come home and I'd start calling her name. Eden. 
Eden, babe, daddy's home. Eden, it, daddy's getting ready to get something to eat, eat. And she wouldn't respond. She wouldn't show up. Every now and then, you'd hear a cackle. You'd, you'd, you'd hear a laugh a little bit. You'd, you'd hear a giggle, but she would never come out. And I would get tired of calling her name. So much so, you figure out the hiding places. You know she going to hide in that kitchen cabinet. It's only so many places in a house this kid can fit. I know exactly where you are, but I ain't going to keep calling you. And so what I would do is we get food, me and the wife, we get food, we sit down and eat, and some time would pass, and then Eden would come out, and she'd be looking all disgusted, she'd be looking all disappointed, she'd be looking all concerned, what's wrong with you? Well, daddy, you never found me, or, or daddy, I'm hungry, daddy, I want something to eat, where's the food? And I tell her, well, babe, we ate a long time ago. You what? We Daddy went to the store, got the food, cooked it. We ate it. We've been done. Daddy went to Texas Roll House and got the to-go food. Daddy went to Cane's and got the food and got it and ate it and sitting here. And, and, and you were hiding. And I had to tell her just simply this. Had you chose to stay in my presence, you could have got what was in my hand. Had you chose to stay in front of me, had you chose to come out and be with me more than concerned with what you had, you could have got everything I had. And so now that the iPad has died, you realize the iPad couldn't, could say, couldn't sustain all your needs. <laughs> Some of you have been thinking a tree can sustain you and you've been hiding from the Lord. Because here's the reality. Can we, can we be kids for a second? The Lord trying to play house. He trying to be the daddy, you be the child, and you too busy trying to play hide and go seek. And then you wonder why you become distant and devastated and depressed. Because whenever we become distant from daddy, we always experience devastation. That's the vertical one. Then there's the horizontal one, though. We damage the horizontal relationship on this independence. Yep, horizontal. Genesis 3 verse 12 says this. The man said... The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. That woman, that woman you gave me, Lord, she did it. It ain't me. Had you not given me her, I was good till I didn't have her. Because we always blame each other for the drama we're dealing with. We always blame each other for the problems that we have. The problem with fruit poisoning is you blame the whole establishment for the pain of one item. And so now you eat one bad biscuit and you throw the whole restaurant away. You, you know what I'm talking about. You have one bad haircut and now you want to get a self haircutting system as if you can really do any better. You have one bad. Oh, can I really come for you? You, you had one bad relationship and now all men are filling the blanks. One bad relationship. Now all men do this. All men. You have one bad relationship. Now all women do this. All women do that. Okay? You, you, you get into it with one person in the seat next to you. Now you throw the whole church away. You, you, you have one bad experience with a leader or, or a greeter or a worship team member. Now the whole establishment is messed up. And so you reject opportunity in your future because you're still messed up about the opposition in your past. That's what the fruit does. You let the hurt of an individual make you reject community. Okay, listen, watch, watch, watch this, watch this. You got to understand what this mental knowledge, it's a consequence. I know you're saying, how is that a consequence to know more mentally? This is why. Because when you get independent like this, you subject yourself to knowledge by experience instead of knowledge by his omniscience. Okay, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it real clear for you. So that means now you got to try it before you trust it. We didn't never have faith in the garden. Uh-oh. There's no mention of faith in the garden. You don't need faith until you learn something to challenge it. There's no talk of that. There's no talk of we didn't need an Abraham with Adam had a never eaten the fruit. I'm sorry. I got to move on. God help me. We subjected ourselves to a knowledge we didn't need. That's why our relationships are jacked up. Because I got to try it before I trust it when God wanted you to trust it before you tried it. Okay? He wants us to trust him and not it. And we need to trust him because we need to quit acting like our decisions have always been the best anyway. Okay, I got to run on. Here we go. 
Two more things for you. Here we go. Take notes. Number two. Number two. Uh, second, second consequence of fruit poisoning is idolatry over reverence. It's idolatry over reverence. So this is the consequence of moral knowledge. <laughs> there's a consequence of mental knowledge. Then there's a consequence of moral knowledge. Okay. An idol is simply a little guy, a little G-O-D. An idol is anything that I put above God. Watch what the tree did. Watch what it did in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Watch the progression of the tree. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You get it? So we were made in his image after his likeness. By Genesis chapter 3, we're in the garden. There's a tree we're not supposed to eat, and we eat of it. By Genesis 4... Cain kills Abel. By Genesis 5, verse 3, watch what it says. Genesis 5, verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. After his image and named him Seth. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? In Genesis 1, we were made in God's image. By Genesis 5, Adam is producing in his own image. Because idolatry makes you put you over him. Idolatry makes you put it over him. Idolatry makes you trust resources over the source. This is why when things fall apart, we blame God. The investment fails, and we want to know why God didn't provide, and God is like, I didn't tell you to put your money there to begin with. The relationship fails, and Ray Ray and hurt your heart, and God like, I never told you to be with Ray Ray to begin with. We blame God for our decisions. We blame God for our bad choices. Eating the fruit simply gave them, this is what it did, it gave them knowledge, anagalus, to the knowledge of God. I'm going to say it again. Eating the fruit gave them knowledge, anagalus, to the knowledge of God. Here's the problem. It was different in its nature and its effect. Okay, okay, uh, let me help you with that. Uh, uh, my daughter, going through our drawers, recently found uh, our son's uh, old phone. We didn't realize we still had his old iPhone SE. Old iPhone SE. To make matters worse, pray for me, because I really don't want to let my baby have his phone, but it works. Like, it turns on. Come to find out it works so much. Pray for my stewardship right now. I'm going to make a confession. I've been paying for this line and didn't even remember it. So it texts, it calls, it does everything. And so she ran downstairs one day because we let her play with it every now and then. She said, Daddy, um, the phone needs an update. And I get the phone and I grab it and the Holy Spirit, I won't even say something today. I'm going to keep it 100. Holy Spirit said, hit the details. Hit details in the description of the update. And it said this, this update, watch what it said, is compatible for iPhones 12 Pro Max, 12, uh, 11 Pro, 11 X, S, X, uh, 10, 8, and then it stopped. It never said it was compatible with the SE. What I realize is if I download this software onto this phone, I'll destroy it. If I download an update that's greater than it inside of it, it'll stop working. It won't function how it was originally designed. I'll need to take it to someone greater than me to restore it. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for next week. I'm getting ahead. Listen to me. It didn't, it couldn't handle the update. It wasn't built for that. That was the problem eating the tree. We weren't built for it. We were designed for divine admiration. We were designed for divine affection. We were designed for divine connection, not an overload of information. We were designed, here it is, to revere God. We were designed for reverence, not for idolatry. And the issue is not that the tree gave us a sense of morality. Uh-oh, did you catch that? The tree didn't give us a sense of morality. I'm going to mess with you. We had morality in our creation. We had a sense of right and wrong. We had an understanding of good and evil. I'm going to tell you how. Because God told us what was good and evil. He made plants good. He made animals 
good. He made water, good. He looked at Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. There's a sense of morality in the garden. And what, what was this moral knowledge we got? The moral knowledge we got was the sense of ability to determine what was moral. Hope you caught that. The tree essentially gave us the ability to determine our morality. Yeah, I'm going there. And so we went from morality by authority to morality by ability. Press pause, rewind, say that again. We went, we went from morality by authority to morality by ability. Because before we knew what was good, because whatever God said was good, it was good. Whatever God said was not good, was not good. And now with this knowledge and this ability, we just start deciding and determining ourselves what is good and not good. Can I go there? So, so you, know, you know what the tree did? You know what fruit poisoning did? Fruit poisoning gave us the ability for one human to think it was okay to own another one. You, you, you know what fruit poisoning does? It gave us the ability to think that if you slap me, then I can kill you and you can retaliate. It, it is fruit poisoning. Can I tell you what fruit poisoning does? That you look at somebody else's sin because they have a same sex attraction, but you can't stop eating and now you want to judge them. Can, can I keep it 100? You don't manage your money well, but, but you mad at them. They, they, they slept with somebody after they got married. You slept with two dozen people before you got married. Now you judging? It's fruit poisoning. You, you think you have the ability to determine what's moral. And so now we begin to value possessions and people and property and places and things. When God said, stop trying to figure out what I've already worked out. Somebody needs to confess this. I'm not saying put your business in the chat. Don't do that. I'm not saying put your business in the chat. But I need you to say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. God, whatever you say is good, that's what I want. God, whatever you say is not good, keep that away from me. God, whatever you have for me, that's what I want. I want, I want, I want morality by authority. Not on my jacked up ability. Here we go. Let's get out of here. Number three. Number three. Food poisoning causes one, independence over relationship. Independence over relationship. Number two, it causes idolatry over reverence. Number three, it causes insufficiency over rest. Yep, you heard me right. We end up choosing insufficiency over rest. Yep. This is the consequence of mechanical knowledge. Hope you caught that. So here we go. So it's a consequence of mental knowledge. It's a consequence of moral knowledge. It's a consequence of mechanical knowledge. Okay, here we go. Let's read a few verses of scripture here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 says this. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. Okay, so here we go. Okay, we already know Eve had the consequence of childbearing. The serpent has got a crawl on his belly. What does all that look like? In other words, we got to work for what was willfully available. It's just that simple. Now we have to constantly and begrudgingly and consistently work for what was already available to us. Man has to work, but here's the kicker. This is what I want you to get. Okay, I just saw this in a text three days ago. Man was never cursed. The ground was. It was not the issue of man working. It was now the ground he had to work on. The man doesn't get cursed. The ground does. The ground is going to be difficult for him all the days of our life. Here's the problem with that. We have rearranged the curse. And it has indoctrinated us to think that I need to work till I make it. You know the saying, I sleep when I die. No, bro. No, if you don't sleep, you're going to die. 
That, that, that's just biology. It has indoctrinated us to think that the harder I work, the better I'll be. But we all know somebody who works 100 hours and still broke. Because before the tree, before the tree, we had ignorance and innocence. <laughs> yep, I said it. No, did he just call me ignorant? I did. You, you had ignorance and you had innocence. Listen, ignorance really was bliss because it is the type of ignorance that babies have with their parents. You know what I'm talking about. They don't need to know how, when, what. They ignorant. They just know when they're hungry, they get fed. When they dirty, they get changed. When they're cold, they get a blanket. When they're hot, we leave them in a onesie or just a diaper. They don't even have to understand it. They just know it happens. Because here we go. This is key. Write this down. It was the ignorance that does not know what sorrow is. And it was the innocence that does not know what sin is. I'm going to say it again because you need to get it. It was an ignorance that would never know what sorrow is. And it was an innocence that would never know what sin is. And Jesus, God help me, shows up and helps us out though. He says, uh-uh. You messed up. I'm here now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you together. This is pre the cross. This pre, you got to come next week. This is pre the cross, though. He says, I do not need to work more. I need to rest more. Wait, what? I need to rest to make it because if not, you're choosing insufficiency. Okay, I'm going to show you in the Bible. Here we go. Two texts. We're going to go backwards. Here we go. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Somebody church, you're going to quote it with me. Come to me, King James, come unto me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and what's going to happen? And I will give you rest. Okay, Matthew 6, 33. Watch it. Matthew 6, 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Did you catch it? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, I give you rest. <laughs> Matthew 6, 33, seek me, everything else will be added. Let's go in chronological order. Jesus is giving a sermon on the mount. In Matthew chapter 6, he makes this incredible statement after his beatitudes. After he starts lining up the constitution of the kingdom, he says this. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. I've said this to you before. I know I have, but you need to get it. He says, if you seek me, everything else will be added. If you come after me, everything that you feel you're in need of that the ground won't produce for you, I'll give it to you. If you come after me, if you seek me first and my righteousness, I'll give you what you can't get on your own. So if you chase me, what you need will chase you. <laughs> Watch what happens. How is that rest? How is that rest? Because Matthew 11, he reiterates it. When you seek me, you'll rest. When you seek me, when you come unto me all weary and all heavy laden, I will give you rest. Here we go. Watch. Watch what the text is really teaching us then. Then the work, <laughs> the work that Adam needed to realize, which he never grasped because he never repented. The work Adam never realized was the work was not getting to it. The work was getting back to him. The work wasn't getting to the stuff. The work should have been getting back to the Savior. The work shouldn't have been in the ground. The work should have been with God. So you say, so you say, are you saying do nothing? Are you saying don't work? Do nothing, Pastor? No, fam. No, hold on. Here we go. No, 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 no. Let me help you. I'm done. I'll close right here. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm a gym rat now. I may not look it, but five, six days a week, I hit the gym. So any one of y'all want to help your boy with, with, a, with a meal plan and some workout plans so I can get right, let me know. But I be in that gym, 5 a.m. every morning, 5, 5.30, I'm in that gym. And this is what I understand about working out. There is something that you have to do between sets of exercises. There's something that you have to do between exercises themselves <laughs> and there's something you must do between workouts. It's this little thing called 
rest. It is so important that there are even exercises that require it called rest pause sets where you pull the weight down and rest and hold it before you push it back up. There is this moment where you pause and you do nothing. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, what they have coined it now though is called active rest. In other words, it's not that you do nothing. It's just that you stop working the muscle you were working. So if I'm benching and I'm doing chest, while I'm resting chest, I can do some sit-ups. I, I, I can walk in place. I, I can do some jumping jacks. But the rest is on the chest, not on my life. Okay, you're not getting this. You're not getting this. I'm still moving. I'm just not moving in the same way. <laughs> this is what rest teaches me, that I don't work to get approved. I work because I am approved. I don't work. Watch this. I don't work to get ahead. I work because I am ahead. I don't work because I'm a, I get to get ahead. I work because I am ahead. Oh, you missed it. That was bars. I, I don't work. I don't work to get ahead. I work because I am ahead, meaning I work because I am ahead. You got to read your Bible. I am the head and not the tail. I, I am above and not beneath. I, I am the lender and not the borrower. I am who he says I am. And my rest is that I stop working for stuff and I start working to get to him. We got to deal with that. We got to deal with our fruit poisoning. We have to deal with our fruit poisoning. That we learn that, listen, we're standing between two gardens. And here's the reality. I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger because you're like, how do I fix this? You have to come back next week. But the reality is you have a decision to make about your trees. As you stand in these gardens, there are trees. Let's go back to the top. Some trees are for covering. Some trees are for consuming. Some trees are for covenant. So, some trees are for crushing. You've got to make a decision about the trees that you're letting be apparent in your life. I want to pray for you. So wherever you are, unless you're driving, I want you to bow your head with me. I just want to pray for you for a second. Because listen, some of you, the, the decision for you is Jesus, art off the top. You, you, that, that is definitely the work you got to do. You need to get it right with him. You need a relationship with him. For, for others of you, you, you like, man, I, I know Jesus. I, I've done this, this whole salvation prayer thing, but I keep trying to make decisions with my mental knowledge but my moral knowledge, what my mechanical knowledge of how things work. And I need to trust the Lord. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you that in this moment that this seed fell on good soil, that we would make a decision that as we hang in the balance of these gardens, as we stand with these choices, God, that we would remember what you told the children of Israel, that I stand before you life and death. I pray that you would choose life. If we would make a decision to no longer choose the tree that makes us think we're like you, but that we would remember we were already made in your image, already made in your likeness, and that if we trust you, you'll show us where to go. You'll show us who to be connected to. You'll show us what we need. You'll show us our next step. A, 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 man, a man makes plans with the Lord, orders his steps. Lord, that you can be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we would no longer choose our own direction, but we would trust the divine direction of a great God. And so, Lord, we love you, and we thank you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, freedom. Give God some praise in the chat today. Come on, tell God, thank you. Let's honor him. Come on, let's bless his name today because he is good. He is life. He is available for us. Listen, it, it has been my privilege, my pleasure to stand before you today. But listen, don't click off. Stay on. Uh, Kim has some great things that she wants to share with you, how you take your next steps, what's coming up. Listen, I love you, though, freedom. I love you. God bless you. Peace.